laundry basket is never empty. She loses library books. She homeschools her six beautifully exuberant kids and most days feels just a tad bit overwhelmed and crazy. Now, that's a fun, that's a fun bio. And as for myself, as the husband of a wife who educates our children at home, I can see why Anne has struck uh, many a chord. She's also written an award-winning series for children entitled A Child's Geography, the profits of which are allocated to Compassion International, for whom she travels on behalf of the needy. Anne writes a column for the Dayspring website and is a contributing editor for the High Calling website. Again, all of us at Patrick Col Henry College are delighted to welcome Ann Voskamp and Marvin Olasky. Well, the interviews we've done so far this week have been with politicians and public policy people. So we've heard about the busy world of Washington and all the intrigues and plots that go on there. And today we can turn to not only a different country, but, an, but a very different world. Uh, tell us a little bit about where you live. Um, my husband and I make our home um, southwestern Ontario, about an hour and a half from Toronto. Um, we farm 600 acres of land, and we have um, 650 sows that, um, so we have about a thousand little piglets in the barn at all times. Um, can all of you hear about the thousand little okay? piglets? I'm okay. Yeah. I have to be louder. My kids would say, you can do loud, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we live on about 600 acres of land in um, southwestern Ontario. Um, I farm corn, soybeans, and wheat in three-year crop rotation. And we have um, 650 sows with a thousand little piglets in the barn at all times. So we feel very blessed. And it's at the end of a gravel road? We are at the end of a gravel road. Actually, I feel um, many farms, the, the houses were built 150 years ago off um, side roads that run this way. Our house, for some reason, was built so it's off the, the, um, off the far side road. So I phase out to Bush one way and Bush the other way. So I don't have, um, I feel very secluded and quiet. And, and where do you write in your uh, house? <laughs> um, my husband um, is not a reader. We close every meal with scripture, morning, noon, and night. So he reads his Bible and he reads the farm newspaper. But um, and my side of the bedroom is floor to ceiling, literally, of books. <laughs> um, he supported the writing. He built a little 10 by 10 foot cabin on the edge of a cornfield. So I got out late at night and early in the morning and right in a very quiet, still space when um, the kids are either in bed or they've, um, all, um, all six of the kids go out at 5.30 in the morning and work two and a half to three hours in the morning at the barn with Daryl in the morning, so I can write then too. Okay, so at what time in the, in the evening do you head out to the cabin typically? Oh, it'll be late after everyone goes to bed, is, depending if my oldest two have finished up all their homework, <laughs> um, 9 o'clock, 9.30. Okay. And um, I'm right for a few hours. How and far? How far away is the cabin? Not the very far. Um, how many? Would that be? 200 feet from the house. Okay. So um, not very far. And the year that I wrote 1,000 gifts, a lot of hours out in the cabin and not a lot of sleep. Whereas I have a much better sleep schedule now. <laughs> Okay. And so you'd be writing, when you were writing the Thousand Gifts, yeah. you'd typically start at 9 p.m. and work Yeah, until, until about 2 o'clock in the morning. And then if I got four hours sleep, and then I'd get some hours again in the morning before we started school. So it was, a, it was an intense year. And the month of January, when the book was due, um, Daryl's not out in the fields in January. <laughs> um, and normally he would take on projects in the shop and in the barn, but he chose that particular month. He, um, he homeschooled all the kids okay. and did the laundry and made the meals. And I come in and say, I can't do this anymore. And he'd say, Lord's called us to this. Oh. We can keep going. And in January, it's very cold. Oh, very cold. But you know, <laughs> um, he insulated that cabin very, very well. <laughs> and it has a very toasty little heater. And it was the snow it, for me that um, the cabin is step into that space, and it's a space where I really met the Lord there. It was um, hallowed ground for me. Okay. 
And do you write on a computer? I write on a computer, yes. I've gone through a few lately. Okay. <laughs> And, and as you're writing, and you're, are you self-editing as you go along, or...? Yeah, I, I'm not a fast writer at all. It comes slow. I really believe I'm... I come empty, and I wait upon the Lord. So it really is a, a waiting process, and a patient process. And uh, write a chapter, and then edit it, and edit it, and edit it, and edit it. And edit it. Um, but it's, um, I don't think um, we mine creativity from within. I think it's bestowed from on high from God. Uh, so honestly, I didn't think anyone would ever read 1,000 Gifts at all. It's quirky and idiosyncratic, and the language it's not an easy read. Um, but it, my husband and I both felt that the Lord had used it to change us. And what would show up on the screen would be things I didn't know of that spoke to me and ministered to me in my own life. So that we were just grateful for the process for us as a family and are humbled that he's used it for other families. I, I tend to feel that I, I don't really know what I think until I have mm, to write. Yes, it. exactly. That is exactly it. And, or I would begin to write a story and not really know where it was going to go and um, be surprised how the Lord was weaving threads that I didn't see when I was living it, when I was writing it, to see how He is weaving everything to bring glory to him. No, I don't know what I think. I actually see, I view writing in lots of ways as a handicap. Other people can just live their life and they understand it. Yeah. I, have to, I have to write it to understand yeah. it. And uh, well, there's that famous line from Eric Little in, the ch in Chariots uh, of Fire. Yes. As I run, I feel God's yes. pleasure. Yes. Right? Actually, Marvin, there were lots of nights, poor Daryl, I would run in from the cabin and wake him up out of sleep <laughs> to say, I thought, I thought it was about this, but look what the Lord gave us. <laughs> and, and, and yes, to feel his smile and the exuberance and the excitement over, um, over God and his word and his character and who he is. Okay, so now let me go back a ways. Yes. Um, because you and your family haven't always mm. felt God's smile. Mm. Uh, you start out a thousand gifts mm -hmm. with the, the death of your sister. Yes. And could you talk about that a little bit? Um, I was raised in a non-Christian home. Um, my mother was raised um, Catholic, um, cultural Catholic. Um, the death of my sister, she was 18 months old and killed in our, crushed by a farm delivery truck in um, our family's farmyard in front of my mother who was standing at the kitchen sink. Um, My father never shadowed a church door after that for probably 18 years after that, and then only came to church to witness my baptism. Um, really, his line was, uh, if there really was a God, he was definitely asleep at the wheel that day. Um, and for me, the death of Amy was my first memory. So how, I, how old were you then? Four. four. So I really felt uh, my life was formed by fear, um, formed by a very dark, uh, horrifying day. So that particular event really shaped our family seriously, detrimentally impacted my parents' marriage and shaped who I was as a person that I think 1,000 Gifts was working my way back to living open-handed and accepting the sovereignty of God and that all is grace because all is being transfigured to bring glory to Christ. Um, 
and to understand that as God sustained the Israelites on manna, which literally means what is it, mm -hmm. that can we be sustained in situations where we don't understand the whys, but we trust the who and why. Not, not, not needing to know the why, but, but allowing God to feed us on what seems to us like mystery. So the, the, the book sometimes feels as if, as if you're, you're preaching to yourself. Uh, <laughs> exactly, Marvin. I do it in the house all the time. Okay. I actually I preach the gospel to the person who needs to hear it the most, me. I think, um, honestly, and the, the blog in lots of ways is the same way. There's not comments on the blog. I'm not preaching to someone else. It's me taking scripture and preaching it back to me we need to hear the truth of the gospel over and over and over again. So the book and the blog, I don't have, I am chief among sinners. I need the truth of God's word and to encounter afresh the grace of Jesus Christ. It is a preaching back to me, Marvin. So you, you, you grew up with this sense mm -hmm. of fear. Mm -hmm. how, did that, how, did, how did that affect you and um, when did that start to change? I think, um, by the time my second year of university, I was experiencing um, anxiety attacks and agoraphobia. By the time I got to, um, I finished off that second year before we were married, I was on um, anti-anxiety medication and antidepressants. And um, I think um, my husband is, firmly, firmly rooted in scripture. I was saved in a Good News Bible Club run by his mother. Um, she ran that Good News Bible Club through Ch Child Evangelism Fellowship for 23 years with an average of between 60 and 80 kids every Friday night. She was a beacon um, of the gospel and of Jesus Christ in our community. Marrying him and entering into a family that was entire the entire paradigm, the lens to the world was through Christ. I think that began to change me. I think um, homeschooling my children and as a mother, what was I imparting to my children? I didn't want them to grow up the way I grew up. And being very intentional about my motherhood and the baggage I was still carrying. How was I going to be a different kind of mother than my own mother had been with her own baggage? I think 1,000 gifts and being very intentional about looking for the grace and the goodness of God and beginning to see God very differently, that he was using all things mm -hmm to conform me more into the image of Christ. I didn't have to be afraid of the world anymore because everything was being used to bring glory to Christ. There was nothing to be afraid of. And I think 1,000 Gifts really was a turning point for me. And I think blogging in general, because it's, it's journaling, it's, it's writing and seeing your life in print. Do I want my story to read this way? If I don't, yeah. what do I intentionally have to change so my story reads differently? Yeah. Do you, do you have a sense that your children are, are growing up uh, without, without fear? Yes, I would definitely. Um, because in our home, I still, my default is still to go back to fear. And I will out loud preach the gospel to myself. My children hear me, mm -hmm. quoting scripture back to myself, giving thanks in situations, being very intentional about focusing on the Lord. And they are being, they're writing their own 1,000 gifts, their default. Mm. Uh, and for us to close every meal reading scripture, we're constantly reorienting to truth that I didn't grow up with and have had to relearn as an adult. And you homeschool all six of them. Mm. And so do they, do they learn about God's providence in their, uh, in their academic studies? My two um, oldest, Caleb and Joshua, um, are enrolled, enrolled with Veritas Press Online Academy out of, um, out of Lancaster. Gotcha. So um, all of those classes are open and closed with, with prayer and scripture and our sovereign world view looking at 
their paradigm is definitely um, the sovereignty of God, the providence of God. And I'm, I'm grateful to still have my four youngest ones that I am primarily homeschooling um, to take all of the literature, all of what we learn in a day, and filter it through God's Word. And I um, wish I'd had a different upbringing. But I'm, God uses all things for His, His purposes and His glory. So I wouldn't change any bit of the story, but I'm, I'm grateful that their lives, Lord willing, it's a different story than my own. So how did you become a, a reader and a writer? Because that uh, really wasn't the family. No, it wasn't. I think, um, I think a lot of my pain as a child, it was easier to escape into mm. books and into yeah. words than to try to wrestle out what was happening in our family life. Um, words was a different place to go. So I was a voracious reader, read all of the books in our public school library. Mm. Um, words were safe for me. And then you started writing? I am a, I've always journaled, oh, okay. and shelves at home in the study filled with journals. It was a way to process when I didn't know how to talk to anybody about hmm. the fears or what was happening. Write it down on the page. And so it really wasn't until college and that, and that, that group that you started hearing the gospel? I would say I, got, um, I was saved at a Good News Bible Club when I was nine and a half. Okay. To live that faith out in a non-Christian home, I wasn't attending services on Sunday morning. When I was 16, um, the family that I, um, Daryl's family, and being saved at Good News Bible Club, they started picking me up and taking me to church every Sunday. Okay. So by the time I was 16, that's living it out in my own quiet time with the Lord reading scripture. So I wouldn't say I started growing in my faith to my mid-teens. Okay. Okay. But then you met your future husband in, in, that, mm -hmm. in that situation, yes. that environment. Yes. And so you knew each other for quite a while yes. before getting married. And then you were married at age 20. At 20. Um, okay, which is, which is younger than average. <laughs> oh, not sure. I wouldn't recommend that to you, 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 you wouldn't recommend it? I for my own life, I wouldn't change any yeah. of that at all. Um, Daryl and I had been together since we were 16. We grew up together and... Um, grew in the Lord together, we're young and poor together. Um, I think um, if at 20 you're mature and you know who you are in Christ mm -hmm. and you understand you're stepping into covenant, yeah. um, then yes. But I think that's um, a great deal of prayer. And you have the blessing of your parents that they believe you really are ready to stay, take that kind of step of commitment. Um, I pray our children are at that age. But I look at 20-year-olds now and think, wow, we're really that young. Mm -hmm. Yes, we were. <laughs> and, and so you're journaling all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And at some point, that becomes public. When did your blog begin? I think, I was, I think that's um, fall of 2003 or 2004, Marvin. Okay. Um, and yeah, and I had I journaled up until that point as a young mom, every day journaling, not just um, journaling in a vacuum, but taking scripture that I'm reading mm -hmm. and laying that down in the journal and how am I living this out and where is the sin in my life that you, I need to confess and work through. So never journaling apart from God's word. I think um, blogging came out of still continuing on the journaling but if I could use it in a public forum, very quiet, I didn't think anyone ever read anything. Um, if God could use what I was wrestling through in another mother's mm. life, if he could use it, was it a way to go into all the world with me still being a stay-at-home mom, right. serving my husband and my kids? So when you, had you, had you shown your journals to anyone else at any oh, point? No, 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 okay. no. Uh, Nobody, and uh, now my husband, and, and Daryl still doesn't read the blog. It's, okay. I still see it as a very, um, I must say in the last six to eight months it's been harder to see it than that space, but as a quiet space between me and God. Okay. But suddenly uh, when you when you start doing the blog in two thousand three, it's really not just between you and God at that point. Suddenly no, you have and readers. I think but I had um I never had comments. I've mm -hmm. never installed a, a site meter on it. So it was never okay. I was never thinking there was anyone really out there. I mean, now and then you'd get an email, but you have no sense of right. And actually, literally, up until what, last fall, 
the blog was literally, the screen was black. I saw it as a dark, quiet space and needed it to be a dark, quiet space for me to write in. Okay. So you don't really know how many people are reading it? Actually, um, Lisa Jo Baker is here somewhere. Thank you. I actually ask her, when my agent has to send numbers to Zondervan about who reads it, I ask her to go and find out what that is. <laughs> because I just, honestly, I really feel, it's like David taking a census. Uh -huh. This right. is for God to do whatever God wants to do. When you write, it's to an audience of one. It's to him. It, if he takes it to one person and changes or impacts or influences or encourages one person, that counts. Jesus left the 99 for the one. I, I don't like numbers, Marvin. Yeah. So there, but there's a, there's a literary agent who reads it. Yeah, he takes care of all that with Zondervan. I don't, and he's been very, um, very respectful and sensitive that with 1,000 gifts, I don't want to know numbers. Okay. I don't want to. That's for God to do whatever God wants to or not want to. It's, that's not my responsibility. I'm to be faithful just to what he's called me to do, and that's not it. So you've never looked at where you are on the Amazon? No, I, I am. I, actually, when I buy books from Amazon, I feel anxious to get out of there as fast as possible. <laughs> I, am, I don't look at Amazon. I don't watch the numbers. Um, Zondervan will email me if it's on the New York Times that week, but I don't look at the New York Times okay. and stay. It's, it's not my business. That's yeah. for God to do whatever. It's, art really is never about applause. It's about coming to an altar. It's yeah. about laying it down for God to do whatever he chooses to do with it. Yeah. The, uh, then the, the, the making of A Thousand Gifts mm -hmm. comes uh, not through your impulse, but oh. from, from the agent calling you. Yes, and, and he... Uh, I was, I feel blogging could go, you, you don't pay to read a blog. A blog can go anywhere in the world that God wants to take it. I believe that's, that's a Jesus kind of paradigm. Um, so I wasn't interested in writing a book per se at all. Um, that was an agent who came alongside, who was another homeschooling dad who understood what my life looked like very sensitive and respectful to my first calling is to serve my family and to serve my husband and, and the words have to come off the fringe of that. So um, so yeah, 1,000 Gifts came out of him, readers, authors of um, his that read the blog that contacted him and said, maybe God can use this in print format as opposed to just on a screen. Okay, and then uh it, it, it takes off in a sense of readership. And is this a surprise to you? I, I just it's very uncomfortable yeah. for me, yes. Yeah. Very much so. And to be very intentional about um, being faithful just to what God's called me to do. And all of that to um, but it doesn't impact my everyday, day-to-day -day life at all. People send you letters asking for advice <laughs> on things, or? Yes, and to turn them back to a lot of those emails. A lot of those emails I'd love to answer. My husband says every, and he's right. Every time I say yes to that person, I say no to my children in my own home. Yeah. So, it, so I feel the burden and the weight of not responding to people. But if I respond to those people, the end of my life, where are the souls of my six children? So you don't want to see what my inbox looks like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't, I'm not very good at answering a lot of emails. There are times and places where the Lord lays one person and I really will make an effort to respond to that person. But I could spend all day emailing and I wouldn't be doing what I'm really supposed to be doing. Yeah, yeah. The, um is there an example of, of one letter that really did touch you so much that you had to respond? Mm. I think I resonate with them. Um, I'm very intentional about responding to women who have lost children. Or um, women who have lost a sibling. I understand to some extent what that does to a family culture. So to come alongside those women and I think 
women who are in marriages where there is infidelity, they don't know where to speak of that pain. Those are women that I will try to come alongside of. And women who have come out of horrific family of origin or life story, where they're really struggling with all is grace. How can all be grace? What, if, mm -hmm. what, what is this ugly situation? To come alongside that kind of heart howl and acknowledge it. And God wants us to lament. That's very different from complaint. Complaint doesn't see the goodness of the character of God. Lament is honest and authentic about the feelings, but knows the goodness and the benevolence of God. So to be authentic about the lament, but then come back to what does scripture say about the sovereignty of God and that how, how God, God allows these things to happen to conform us more into the image of his son and to ultimately bring glory to himself. So those are the kinds of letters that I will try to take the time and, um, and to serve and to wash the feet of someone in pain. So it seems that people react differently to this understanding of the sovereignty of God mm. and the I think that's a, we can know it intellectually, mm -hmm. we can know it scripturally, but then something horrific, a bomb happens in your life. And, okay, how do, I, how do I take what I know and know it in my heart and live this out? What do I do with all this pain? So how do you do it? I think, um, for me, like, as I wrestle through in, in 1,000 Gifts, the hard Eucharist day. Can I give thanks in the dark? Because if I can't give thanks in the dark, if I only give thanks in the good, what does that say about who God is? What does it say about how I trust who God is? When I can give thanks for the things that make no sense to me, the things that hurt, that is my public manifestation of what I say I believe, which is God is in control, that nothing is happening randomly, that he is at work in all things. So I think um, for people to be honest about the pain, we look at Job, we look at David, it's, it's never to um, put a band-aid on things or a facade on our pain, but to be honest and, and lay, the, lay the pain out before the Lord and say, like um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego before they went to the furnace, even if, even if I never understand why this is happening, I will not deny that you are good, that you are, I am always loved by you, that even when the chisel hurts, that you are using this to conform me into the image of God. So it's back to preaching gospel to ourselves. Yeah. Amen. Um, well, let, me, let me ask, okay, uh, then about, uh, so, you, so your, your, your father, in a sense, never recovered. Mm -hmm. Your mom did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned also at the beginning of the, of the book the, uh, uh, the, the sadness involving the, the death of your, of your nephews. Two nephews, yes. Two nephews. Uh, and so what's happened to your sister and brother-in-law? Uh, sister and brother-in-law, um, they... Um, it was um, a genetic disorder that took both of those little boys home. So um, it was only supposed to happen, the doctor said, one in four. So that God chose to take the second son also. Much prayer. They have had a third son. Sawyer does not have spinal muscular atrophy. And um, we rejoice in Sawyer, uh, he's now, um, he just turned five. Um, but yes, there's a, there's always an acknowledgement they'd be two older brothers. So there is sadness there, but I think they're, John and Tiffany, um, they lived out open-handedness. John's um, life first comes from Job, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Nothing is ours to hold on to. Um, and they have, it, it's not just 
lip service. They are living that out, that it was it's God's to decide. And um, I'm grateful for Sawyer now, and grateful for the gift of Dietrich and Austin as long as we have Dietrich and Austin. Another question about just your living mm. situation as you're raising your children. Mm. Do you have a television in your house? No television. No television. No television, no radio. Okay. Okay. And I can't remember the last time I watched a movie. <laughs> we just, um, uh, that's it. My husband grew up with no television. So when we got married, we just never brought a television into our home. Um, I used to listen to um, public radio in Canada. Uh, I listened to a lot of politics and what was happening in culture. And my husband said it, <laughs> it would agitate me and I would be very involved. Mm -hmm. And he said, just turn it off and let's live a quiet life unto the Lord. So it's, um, we probably haven't had a radio 10 years. Okay. So. Okay. Newspaper, magazine? No newspaper. Or the farm newspaper comes into the house. Okay. Um, but the internet, we are aware okay. of what's happening in the world. Um, but no, no, no magazines or... I think for, we're very intentional about the literature that we bring into the home and that we really long to be a family that's word formed. If we're going to spend time reading, spend the time reading scripture and, and meditating on the truth of God's word. And you wrote at one point in your blog about the importance in a sense of, uh, and I don't remember the exact wording, mm. but, but not sequestering yes. from school kids. I, I think um, we're called to go into all the world with the gospel. And greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. So how now do we um, not get ourselves into homeschool ghettos, but we, um, we engage the world and and to be a bright light of the hope of Jesus Christ. I think of my mother-in-law, if she had sequestered, she had the truth, but if she hadn't had that Good News Bible Club for 23 years with, with 80 kids every week, I wouldn't be saved. Mm -hmm. So how do we bring the gospel to, to the families around us um, in, in careful, thoughtful ways that don't leave our children in them? Um, in places of disadvantage at all, but, but places where we as a family are going into the community with the hope of Christ. There are, there are families around us that will, that will die Christless if someone doesn't share the gospel with them. Yeah. So to be intentional about um, reaching out to our neighbors. Okay. Second, second call for any questions or oh, comments or thoughts. Good. Some hands up over here. Thank you very much for coming to speak to us today. I had two questions for you. First of all, you talked about being intentional about literature. So I'm interested in knowing, do you have any particular favorite books or authors that you'd like to share? And second of all, uh, do you ever encounter writer's block and how do you deal with that? Mm. <laughs> Actually, I think the two questions go together. I think um, when I encounter writer's block, it's really important to be reading because um, I never am reading one book at a time. I'll be reading three or four different authors at the same time so those books begin to have a conversation with each other and then I begin to engage what that conversation is about and words come out of that so I think if if I don't have words it really is a sign I'm not reading enough um, in terms of who is my favorite authors I read I don't I don't read a lot of um, contemporary I don't read hardly any fiction I really have to be intentional I, when I'm reading fiction, I'm reading aloud to my kids. Um, personally, I read mostly, almost exclusively nonfiction that would be classics. I read a lot of um, C.S. Lewis. I'm reading contemporary uh, John Piper. Um, I read a lot of um, usually theology because I'm trying to figure out how do I take theology and make it very practical at the kitchen sink <laughs> and in the mudroom and with my kids. So um, those are the kinds of things that I don't want to only live out of my head. It has to put flesh on it. And I think that's, that's the blog in 1000 Gifts is how do I take theology and make it very, very practical um, for the mom who's, who's loving on babies. 
John, John Piper is a terrific uh, pastor and theologian in Minneapolis. Mm. Uh, he's written a lot of books, which, and I, and I can certainly see his influence. Yes, in your thinking. yes. Um, which, which do you recommend for people who haven't read any Piper? Oh, I think I started with Future Grace. Okay. Um, and still keep going back to Future Grace, Desiring God. Um, but I think Future Grace is really what, I think what I really appreciate about Mr. Piper is, is um, his theology based in scripture, but his, his passion and his, um, his poetry, his lyrical language, his mm -hmm. fresh, so it's, um, you can see that it has moved from head to heart in a very um, biblical, scriptural way. I think um, contemporary, that would be where I was reading, yeah. I think it's in Future Grace that Piper uses a metaphor that stuck with me that, uh, that in a sense we are all skydiving from 30,000 mm. feet uh, and just hurtling okay. down, but uh, some of us have a parachute. We know we have a parachute mm -hmm. and others don't. And that makes a considerable difference in the way we think as we're plunging toward Earth. Yes, that helps with your fear levels, doesn't it? Right. Right. <laughs> See, other, there's yeah. another question or comment over here. Mm. Back over here. By the window. Thank you very much for, uh, for coming out here. Um, it's an honor to have you. I was really fascinated by what you had to say about um, just how you manage your time and mm -hmm. how sometimes you have to say no to people that um, okay. want your help. How do, you, um, how do you work through and make those decisions? What, what's mm -hmm. kind of, uh, what do you use to determine mm -hmm. what to focus Where, your time yeah. on? It's a very good question. And I'm still in deep process through this. <laughs> Um, I think going back, understanding that when Jesus, God himself here on earth, he didn't heal every sick person. He didn't, um, and that's God. I, I can't, I'm, to live in a place of humility, I, I can't, I can't meet everybody's needs. I can't, I'm one broken sinner clinging to the cross and grace. I think it really is keeping company with the Lord and praying over every situation. The Holy Spirit speaking and, and you being um, attentive to, um, to that discerning voice about this is the way, walk in it. And to know that this is a person that he's called you to and this person here is a person I'm praying for in this moment to never read flippantly and to re always, you, whether you can respond or not, you can be praying and, and to bring that person to prayer immediately. And there's people I have never responded to that the Lord brings to mind months later and I will stop and pray for that person. So, um, and whether you can, um, there are other people to bring alongside you to say, can you meet the needs of this person here and sometimes to forward and redirect an email to someone that you know can reach out and come alongside that person. But I think, there are no formulas for these things, but God is living and active, and for us to, to live in a posture of direct my footsteps, Lord, to, to who I can respond to, and, and to be very intentional about what is your vocation, <laughs> what is your calling, and for me, my first calling is my children serve my husband at home, writing comes after that, and, and then to, is there enough margin to reach out beyond that. Okay. Question over here from Sarah Pride. Mm. Thank you so much for coming to uh, share some of your time thanks. with us. <laughs> I wanted to ask, how did you, the farm girl, bring your manuscript from your own computer to a published book? Mm. Huh. <laughs> That's a long process. <laughs> um, so an agent coming alongside and saying, these are themes that you're writing about and wrestling through in your life over and over again in the blog. Um, probably, while well, 1,000 Gifts took um, 12 months to write, the outline probably took almost two years to come about, and the living of it a lot longer than that. Um, and I really believe 
books can't be manufactured or they're not formulaic or even when you have it a theological understanding in your head writing it will mean nothing to someone else unless they can see how you put flesh on that so it has to come out of your life and your living to carry any weight it's the word incarnate you have to live it so um so writing it for a year but that process of writing it for a year i had um a freelance editor who came alongside. So I would send a chapter, every time the chapter was finished, send the chapter to him. He would say, oh, you're holding back. <laughs> you need to go deeper and tell us what's really going on and not just on the surface. So to be accountable to somebody who um, says you need to tell the whole truth here. <laughs> and um, say the hard things, the vulnerable, transparent things. So to have someone, one person come alongside, so that was a 12-month process, and then, um, and then an agent. Um, so yeah, before the book went to contract, I just had um, the first three chapters of the book, which really came more as a whole, because the story really came out of Amy's death, and that's always been what I've been, it was so formative to my life. So those first three chapters and the, the 12 months writing after that, but um, a farm girl doesn't know much. <laughs> I think coming alongside people, God bringing other people to come alongside me and say, this is how we go through this process, because um, I, still, I still can't say that I'm a writer. I don't feel like a writer. I tap things out on a keyboard. I feel like a blogger, but not a writer. No. <laughs> I know that some people after reading A Thousand Gifts, have started making their own lists yes. and so forth. Is that, for, for students here who want to be writers, mm. uh, do you recommend uh, starting with a list? Yes, on, it's funny, G.K. Chesterton says, um, how does he say that? The greatest poetry comes out of lists, and you're thinking, really? Um, but that, um, because the list making is slowing you down enough to see, mm. and, and writing, comes out of attentiveness and about the way you see the world, the way you see the sovereign hand of God moving. So the list doesn't seem like <laughs> literature at all, <laughs> um, but it, it's becoming very intentional, uh, a practical way of opening your eyes up to your life and seeing your life and, and starting to, to notice the things otherwise you would have missed. So I think, um, well, the list itself isn't, <laughs> may not spawn any great thought. <laughs> It'll be the practice of seeing. Um, I don't know, we, uh, it's Kate DeCamillo who says that she doesn't really feel um, the Lord, she's not a Christian, she doesn't, I would never say, I don't feel like the Lord has gifted me or talents, with talents in any way, but if you can, if you can slow down enough to see, you will see what other people are missing and, and be able to bring that to the table. And um, really, what do they say? Genius is a, is a long faithfulness. And, and I think it's a being a, faithful with how we, we slow down to really notice and see what in a world, we're, we're all moving way too fast, <laughs> to slow down enough to go ahead and see. I guess when you slow down, you have to mm. pay attention to specific detail, yes. play, to pay attention to the physicality of things. And, and, and that all plays it. into writing, right? Yeah. Like if we're yeah. really good writing, at, from my perspective, I see it runs a lot like, um, like visual on a screen. So you need to create that kind of detail and to have that kind of credibility with the reader, that the reader knows you were really there, that you really yeah. experienced it, that you know the details. And that comes out of seeing. Over here, question. Mm. Thanks, Anne, yeah. for being Thanks here for and um, just for sharing mm. such such vulnerability and honesty in your writing. I'm sure that was really hard to do that for the whole world to peek in. But when you're riding in the cab in that 10 by 10 foot square space, you feel really brave. And then when it goes <laughs> in the road, it's like, I'd like to grab that and pull that back. Um, but, but it's coming to the altar again. God gets to do yeah. what he chooses to do with it. Right. And I, I, you know, in my little group of friends that have um, 
devoured this book. Um, God has used it in, mm. in very powerful ways to, to, to look inside your life mm. and see your relationship with the Father, and mm -hmm. it's been really beautiful. Mm. Um, there are many pieces to this book that I have really appreciated mm -hmm. and resonated with. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my particular favorite chapter, mm. I think it was chapter 8, where you were talking about how mm. in the darkness... God is covering you, it's because he's with you in that moment, mm -hmm. and, and as he brings you through that. That particular, those, what, two pages? Yeah. I was in the cabin writing that, and the cabin does not have internet connection. There was a woman I knew who was going through, um, I think she was, what, 23 weeks? Her baby's heartbeat had stopped and she was going through labor and delivery to deliver mm. a stillborn child. Mm. That, those, that two pages came when I was typing that out. I didn't know those words before they came on the screen. That sounds audacious and I say that very hesitantly and humbly and I mean it humbly. Um, and all of a sudden an email shows up from that particular woman going through labor who was terrified. And I said, these words are meant for you right now, and mm -hmm. copy and paste and mm -hmm. sent those. I have no idea why there was internet connection wow. in the cabin at that particular moment, but yes, mm -hmm. um, when he tucks you into the cleft of the rock, yeah. and it's dark, mm -hmm. the darkest ground is the holiest ground God is passing yeah. by. Yeah, I got that. <laughs> that was very cool. Um, one piece, though, that kind of struck me mm. in this chapter, and I thought maybe you could mm. expound a little mm. bit by what you mm. meant by it, um, because as I look back over my life of, mm. of knowing Christ um, for 30 years, there have been times where he has shown up and said, you haven't trusted me here. Mm. You've trusted me for salvation. Mm. You've trusted me for this. But that little piece that's hidden deep in your heart you haven't allowed me to come in there mm -hmm. and, and heal it and, and mm -hmm. speak to you. Mm -hmm. And I'm stunned. I'm like, well, I thought I've always trusted you. Exactly. But he has said, you haven't trusted me there. So as you say, um, if authentic saving mm. belief is the act of trusting, then to choose stress is an act of disbelief, mm. atheism. Anything less than gratitude and trust is practical atheism. So I just thought maybe you could expound a little bit on that because it's not like I don't believe God. I just haven't trusted him for this. And I think um, I'm, I'm still working that out, going to the airport to do this. I can feel my anxiety. <laughs> and I'm coming back to when I choose stress, am I not advertising the unreliability of God? That, um, if I believe he is real and he is using all of these events in my life for his ultimate good, it may be painful for me in the moment, but it's ultimately to shape me to be more like Christ, then I can trust him. I am, it's one thing to write a book out of one story. As 1,000 Gifts has gone into the world, I've had to learn to trust him on a whole new level. I've had to learn to live this all over again. God has an interesting sense of humor about these things. Um, practical atheism, if we believe what we say we believe, it has to be manifested in our attitudes, in our words, in our own stress levels. And if he's real, and I say I really believe him. I live, have to live in an open-handed place, moment by moment, trusting what he gives me. That's a lifelong process, though. You don't, I am, I'm not there. I haven't arrived at all. And he brings new challenges and says, will you trust me with this too? So it's, um, and maybe, you know, using the word practical atheism, maybe that's strong language, because as a believer, I'm still working that down. So it's not a spiritual atheism, but practically, in that particular moment, am I acting out what I say I believe about the Lord, or am I acting in ways that are very um, disconnected from my faith? So it's, 
it, it's not your spiritual position with God. It's, it's practically what is it looking like in your life right now. That's a stumbling answer, sorry. That was a great answer. Hi, Anne. Uh, I just want to first of all th say thank you yeah. for writing, the courage to writing A Thousand Gifts. Mm -hmm. um, it has, as a homeschool mom of five, it, sorry, it's, um, it's definitely touched my heart in a lot of ways, and um, not many books do that. And I don't read books twice, and I'm already on my second go-round. And I wish I had brought my book with me, because there's so many lines, so many stars, so many brackets for scripture where I've looked it up. Um, and it's even waterlogged, because I think I dropped it in the, in the rain one time. Um, and as, I'm, as I read your book, and as I started through it, I got to the, the section about, oh, thank you, um, where your boys, the, the toast incident. <laughs> And when I got to that, I just have to say thank you for being so vulnerable and, and, um, and honest to write that because as soon as I read that, I thought, oh my gosh, this woman gets it. I have two teenage boys and that's, I think that's the hardest job I have as a mother is refereeing my two teenage boys. The teenage boys. <laughs> and you know that chapter, taking that back to the teenage boys and saying, are you okay with us sharing this story because stories aren't told in vacuums they rub up against other people are they okay with the sharing of the story so the boys said well you don't use my name but everyone will know it's me <laughs> and and my oldest son saying now i'm so much more mature i would never have done it that way now. <laughs> but i think um i think for mamas to know you're not alone. There are really hard days that um, our own flesh comes through in our mothering, that our own children are struggling to act in Christ-like ways. And, um, and I'm stumbling through it. It's not my default to get this right. My default is um, I am fallen. <laughs> and how do I intentionally reorient to the cross and to Christ and to gospel again. You're right, teenage boys. <laughs> it's, um, I've said to my husband, it's sort of like becoming a, the mother of a newborn all over again when you have teenage boys because you've never been here before. Well, as I'm reading through your book the second time, because it has so many, it's wonderful to get to read through it um, with full disclosure. I know where <laughs> you I'm know going. where I'm going. <laughs> I know where I'm going. I know where you're taking me now. And um, the thoughts that you share even have more meaning knowing that. And mm -hmm. um, I wanted to know what, where, what is the Lord speaking to you right now? Where is he, where is mm. he working in your heart? Well, that's a vulnerable question. <laughs> or it requires vulnerability of me. Um, honestly, in this particular season of my life, I have never felt more committed to motherhood and the internal value of children. Um, my life right now in this particular season doesn't look like I want it to look. I want to be home with my kids this morning. So right now, I'm, my husband and I being very prayerful about what do I say yes to and what do I say no to, because ultimately, how those six children walk with the Lord means more to me than anything else does. At the same time, God calls us to go into all the world and to exalt Christ. I feel called to do that from a keyboard late at night. And when a mother does, um, a mother is doing eternal work in hidden, quiet places. There is no applause for what you do every day that shapes culture. I feel very uncomfortable about the position I'm in right now because it is of no more value 
than what women are doing every day, men are doing in every day, in places where there is no applause for what you're doing and no accolades for what you're doing. Christ didn't get accolades for what he did. Christ didn't have a place to lay his head. Christ went lower, not higher. So my own life right now, I'm working very intentionally about the things I believe Christ is about in hidden, in quiet places, that he can use the words where he needs to, but I need to stay as invisible as possible. And Christ alone, people are drawn to him, and um, I'm just broken with everybody else. Thanks for homeschooling your kids. Down here in front. I, I know that you coming from a rural area mm. and, and um, a, a lot of homeschooling mothers, I think mine included, um, often felt very lonely and isolated because mm. um, they were at home all the time and, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't, I know she wouldn't want to give up that time with her kids, but at the same time she had to deal with the fact that she's not, she's not part of really a community anymore mm -hmm. beyond her family. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering how mm -hmm. Did you ever deal with that, and, and how did you address it, or how are you addressing it? I think writing for me was a way of, um, of processing and connecting parts and pieces of my life. Um, I think an online community has allowed me to connect with other women on my own time. Um, even to talk to an, Friends on the phone sometimes can be very difficult if there's an issue happening in your house right then. Ah, oh, I gotta go. <laughs> um, whereas online, you can stop in the middle of the email. You can be doing that late at night. I think, um, I think online offers women a way to connect vulnerably with other women who are in the motherhood trenches with you. But at the same time, that requires discipline to be able to step away from the screen and not use the screen to escape from home and what God wants to do. Sometimes I call, um, it's like being in a pressure cooker sometimes with all the kids. The pressure cooker is to, to cook something fast, to do its work quickly. If you're always escaping somewhere else, God can't do the soul work in you that he needs to do. So I think while um, online for me has healed me in many ways, um, particularly that, that Encourage community that's, um, that Dayspring has, that website for women. Women from all walks of life, um, grandmothers, single women, women homeschooling, women working, meeting together um, with Christ as the center. That community has healed me. But I think at the same time, to be disciplined about when you engage online and when I am here, this, this, I, I name my years. <laughs> And um, this for me has been my year of here, to be present with my children and um, to compartmentalize the online, to, um, to fringe hours, to, um, because the time with our children is but a blink. And um, sometimes when you're in the thick of it, it doesn't feel that way. But um, to be present and to, um, to be faithful to what God's called you to do. But I do think moms, Mother's homeschooling, that can be very isolating. So how do you go ahead and engage in community in a way that doesn't drain from your home, but actually edifies and builds in and encourages you in your, your calling as a mother? I think we need to conclude now. Mm. It's just a little bit past one o'clock. Um, and thank you for mm. being willing to commit this time <laughs> coming here. Um, you know, Give our regards to your children when you get back tonight. I will. I will. And, and thank you for your book. Oh, no. I recommend, if you haven't read it, it's a wonderful book, A Thousand Gifts. And please join me in thanking Anne for coming today. <laughs>